So welcome to this first session in uh, this track, which at the moment yeah, eludes me. So, um, I'm on loan from another track, so that's fine. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Mikael, who's going to uh, give you an introduction to uh, how to interface with sensors freely. This session is also the runner-up to uh, a workshop that's going to be held this afternoon. So if this piques your interest, please, please consider to to participate in that as well. Please welcome. Thanks. So my name is Michael, and um, since this is a free software conference, and you're free to, to move around, come up to look at the things, and this is kind of the centerpiece of uh, discovering what makes an internet of things, a web of things, what kind of devices we use for that. So that's what we'll be taking a look at now, and later on in the day, the workshop will actually be getting our hands on, uh, really uh, starting to use these things and exploring from a, a do-it-yourself perspective. Um, but, uh, so in this hour, it's kind of more explanatory, and these are the topics that we'll look at. Um, some definitions, what is IoT, uh, why is it interesting and relevant for our lives, uh, about the industry and the kind of the business aspect of it, uh, why it's uh, profitable. Um, and then, because this uh, session is termed uh, sensor, it's, it's about sensors, we'll look at the sensor portion of things rather than actuators. Sensor examples, and um, and so we'll see what the difference is between sensors and actuators. Finally, telecommand and telemetry. What that means, how uh, the sensors and actuators are passing data on networks, on IoT networks. And at the very end, we'll take a look at protocols and uh, and the, the transports that are useful in web of things, internet of things. Um, so, the first thing, that's the one thing I don't have on the table, I think. There it is. So, we have some beacons. I'll just show one here. And um, this is what we'll be using most of the time in constructing a physical web of things. So, this is kind of the developer kit that we'll have for later on. Um, and we'll have a lot of other things. These are beacons from the company Estimo. And what they basically do is you put them you put them on a wall or under a table, and it has a, a Bluetooth transmitter inside. It has no receiver, it just has a transmitter, and it's sending out a signal every 10 seconds or so. And so um, uh, a, a different device can get close to this and can read the intensity of the signal, and then it knows just how close it is, its proximity. Um, so uh, this is the kind of experimentation we'll do, a typical IoT network. When we put the devices very close together, which is with very low power, small devices, one of them, you can almost, you can't even see it, it's just here. The whole computer fits on an SDHC card. <laughs> so that's a power system for it. And um, I'd like to start with a demo, maybe to shake things up a little. Uh, at the CCC, the Chaos Communication uh, Camp, um, a group from, I think, Linz had this nice cat, plastic cat, an Asian Japanese cat, out, uh, outside the tent, how you can see this. And the basis of this, uh, uh, ex this demonstration was that the cat would only wink when it received uh, an IoT message from somewhere in the world, from Brazil or some other place. And it would wink at the person who was maybe standing in front or as far as the North Pole. Um, so, that was interesting. We can maybe try to make them wink. We don't see it, so I don't know if it would work. We have no uh, feedback, but uh, we can try that out in the next slide to see the code that, that causes this thing to wink. And in fact, I asked the person, first of all, for permission to do that. Um, and I asked as well what this cat was called. I'm really not sure, but I think it's a cat five. I'm not sure. <laughs> so, anyway. And this is a code, um, one of the ways to make this cat wink. Because it's attached to an MQTT broker, which is one of the protocols uh, that is very relevant and useful in the Internet of Things, MQTT message queue tele uh, telemetry transport. Um, this is kind of the, the typical testing way to uh, make the cat wink. So I don't think we'll have time to get too much into this, but this is a kind of Typical, I think I deleted something there. Yeah, that's how it looks. And actually, we can just cut, copy and paste that. Let's see 
of this rule. Oh, but I don't have, no, I don't have MQTT on this machine. So unfortunately, it's on that one. It's not con connected to the video. So that was the, uh, <coughs> the startup demo, which uh, usually I can make a cat wing someplace in the world. But um, this is the typical world where there are no cats. This is the IoT, Internet of Things, which uh, is a model of our surroundings, our environment. Um, I have quite a lot of things here. I'm not sure if the room is... Do you think, do you think it's good like this, or shall we turn the lights off? Give them a little. Yeah. yeah. Turn them off. <laughs> it's kind of... The contrast is not very good. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so, you know, we can find a cat there. No, there is no cat. So here's this you know, house. We might have a forest fire, so we have some sensors there sensing heat or smoke or gases and uh, things like this. Gases can explode if they're in, in uh, power plants, uh, coal burning or, or um, nuclear or whatever. All of these things are sensing, and we'll have a, a, a description later of a, a smart uh, street light, how that might work and how maybe you can hack one, which would be a lot of fun. And so these are a lot of different things. Of course, logistics, things like shipping or uh, packages from DHL and all of these companies, they've been using IoT systems for a long time, like RFID tags. So, and then uh, what we have here is kind of the idea or the, um, the picture of why this is interesting so many people. Um, it certainly is a buzzword, but we do have this mountain of devices coming online which we saw here in the crushing and going very high up well. Most of the other devices are flat. For example, the, the personal computers and desktop uh, operating systems down here are still growing, of course, but it's been pretty flat. And we have our mobile operating systems, battery-operated smartphones and tablets and so on. The Internet of Things are a group uh, range of devices that we'll see in the next slides that are, um, that are really uh, being manufactured a lot more. and, and um, and well, there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, the typical IDC and the, the Gartner, these kind of groups are making all kinds of estimates. And you'll see this in the newspapers. Uh, uh, it's kind of frustrating sometimes the journalists don't really have a technical background like we do. So we're reading these things, you know, it's, I don't know. Um, it's kind of useful to have uh, understanding of the business aspect as well. When you see these, these uh, Cronin signs, uh, dollar signs, euro signs, billions, and so on. That can kind of that can interest a, a manager, I think. Um, and uh, but to get started into the devices and to know what we're talking about, so this is a this could be outside your your home if you don't even know it. Maybe this is an IBM smart uh, um, gas meter. I think um, we have things already. I think most people are familiar with the Nest platform. They have some fire uh, detectors as well. This is a thermostat which can connect to your smartphone, but it can connect to the internet as well, as well as the door, so when you walk in the house and it turns on, or if your car is approaching, these kind of things, the smart thermostat. And this is the SMO, which we have here. It's actually the same thing as that, like this. And um, there's a few, I mean, there's a lot of beacon manufacturers. This one has some advantages, some disadvantages. If the battery runs out, you can't replace the battery, which is really just a CR2032 battery. It would be very easy, but you would have to make a, a cut there, and the, the advantage is that it's waterproof, so it's encased in plastic. But it means that after three or four years, or maybe less, two years, whatever, then you have to throw it away, unless you want to destroy it, you know, and replace the battery. And this is how it looks inside. So that's the plastic covering that we talked about, and then on the side it's sealed together. And um, that's the CR, well, it's either a 2450, it's some three volt battery, it's a typical coin cell. <coughs> And then this is an ARM M0 microprocessor, a very, very low power uh, microprocessor. It doesn't have a kernel of any kind. It's not running Linux. It's just a microcontroller, in effect. Um, so that's how they look, almost all of them. I've had a few and taken them apart, and they all are running M0 uh, processors. Um, so I, know, I think we all know, um, you know drones. And the thing that makes these special in the Internet of Things is that they're, they're motorized, so they have actuators. And uh, they have sensors as well to keep the pitch and yaw and the direction um, level. So they're sensing their environment and changing their environment as well by pushing air. And um, we'll get to actuators and sensors, what the difference is there in a minute. And so these are some devices that we actually have here that we'll be uh, unpacking in the evening and trying out. Um, I think this one, let's see if I can do this. 
Um, this is a this is a a variant without the uh, the the what are they called poker <coughs> pins or um, it's very low, very sleek, and very low powered. Um, here you can wipe your finger across here, so it has one one human input, and that's a, a, a touch sensor, but it's kind of a slide sensor. It's a bizarre input. It doesn't have a display of any kind or even Ethernet, but it does have a I don't know what processor it is an ARM processor, and the model is a FRTM KL25Z is from Freescale, and uh, the other Freescale uh, variant that we have. I think if I maybe put some light on this. Um, so this is another uh, Freescale microprocessor, which oh, I'm going to have to completely restart. See that's how this works. So. Start computers. That would not be very nice. So, okay, so there's that's a little better. Let's focus that. And this is the uh, Freedom, or what is it called? Free scale. This is another um, uh, board that we'll have in the evening. And can I change this? Is that better? No, that's okay. Anyway, what I wanted to show is that this one has an Ethernet um, socket, so we can connect that to the internet, and the other one, you have to connect it through Bluetooth. Um, so there's a whole variety of things. This one has SDHC as well. So let's go back here. Hello. So that's one example. Then we have this one. This is a Nordic semiconductor, and there is uh, specializing on Bluetooth devices. So this is a pro prototyping board for developers. And it has four buttons here, so you can just push quickly. You don't have to connect buttons and solder things with a breadboard. And it has some, uh, I think, well, some debugging uh, interface there. And it has these, uh, they're not called pogo pins, are they? Does anybody know what they're called? Just pogo pins. Pogo pins are the spring the spring of the ones. So these are headers, yeah, headers. Yeah. yeah, there's plastic headers. So anyway, I think it's 1.2 millimeter uh, plastic headers. And um, almost, almost all devices that have this kind of configuration of physical headers, they're, if you look at this, one side is longer than the other. This is an Arduino shield assembly compatible. So if you have things like, uh, well, there's so many Arduinos in the world. Since 10 years, I've been manufacturing them. And they make things, uh, maybe you know, uh, you know, for robotics or uh, all kinds of sensors. They're just shields for everything. And a lot of manufacturers like Nordic Semiconductor have decided to capitalize on that. And they don't want to create their own format, so they just uh, made the same uh, physical format as the Arduino uses. You can just use your Arduino shields directly on there because it's serial and GPIO is a format of these, uh, is a um, yeah, technical format of those. So we'll have some of those later as well. And uh, here is the smart street light that I was speaking about before. That's how it looks like inside. And I'm actually not sure why there's a, even a cable on it. Well, I guess, yeah, it's probably not. Usually they're wireless, so you can see the, um, the, the, the antenna there. And that's why they're so easy to hack. So every time the DEF CON comes to Las Vegas, for example, we have a lot of interesting things going on in the street because there are enough people there. And it's surprising that the city doesn't uh, pick up on this problem, but <laughs> yeah, so they're quite, um, they're quite funny devices. It belongs to the IoT world, it's a, small, a smart um, street lamp. And so once you imagine all of these things uh, trying to cooperate, sending messages and signals and exchanging data, you have to s find a way to, uh, to, to transmit and uh, receive this data and find a place to store and forward it. It's all about routing. So. This is kind of this kind of the sensor sensory routing model that is uh, typical in the Internet of Things. You have all these devices below. A lot of them are radio operated, battery operated devices that you can just plug on walls or on objects that were made 30 years ago, before the Internet of Things came into being. So you can still have um, you know retrofitted Internet uh, objects like tables um, from IKEA and. So anyway, so you have, so the text is very small. This is heart rate uh, sensor, this is a temperature sensor, location sensor, pressure sensor, altitude sensor, and so on. And all of these devices are then sending their 
uh, sensory data over a network. And this is what tele uh, telemetry means. When you have sensors that are sending data to computing nodes or routers, then they're sending over a network, and this is the meaning of telemetry. And anyways, this sensory router is taking all of these uh, communications from the different sensors. Uh, it, might, it might be doing some control of them as well, turning them off or on, or reading their battery level. But mostly, it's just reading from the sensors which are sending the data. And it's either storing or forwarding that in some way, doing some meaningful routing according to a routing uh, uh, table or, or some kind of logic. It might be uh, sending that via MQTT, which is what this says here, very small. Uh, into a cellular network, it could be using a different protocol called COAP, the constri constrained, um, uh, constrained application protocol. Uh, it could be doing that over Ethernet, maybe. These are just examples. And uh, it doesn't have to be internet, it can be serial or Bluetooth. So we'll take a look at the transports of, as well. And um, to understand this a little, um, we've actually had this for millions of years in our human bodies because we do have sensors. We have eyes for our vision and optical uh, sensory uh, data that we're taking in. We have obviously audio and, and touch uh, and smell and so on. And um, so I kind of like to think of this as uh, the brain is the computing uh, node. It's the uh, router of all of the sensory data coming from the different <coughs> nerves uh, attached to all of the organs in the body. Uh, bizarre there, but it does allude into our wearables, which is probably part of the internet of things. We can debate that, of course. But this is actually have this device, and um, this is uh, this can take your pulse. This can do different things. It has a life meter. It can send its data via radio as well. So this counts as an IoT device. And this is quite interesting. You might not think that this uh, can sense anything. It's usually a headphone which is just uh, sending out audio, physical sound. But actually, these are, are special. I can't remember the, the manufacturer, but um, these audio uh, headphones, when you put them on, you can hear audio in the usual way uh, because they transmit over Bluetooth or they receive over Bluetooth from your phone. And they can take your pulse at the same time, which is kind of creepy. I don't know if I like that idea. Um, but anyway, so... And an even creepier idea is actually this one, which I found just last week. Yeah. I work in hospitals, so one of the best places to check your temperature is also in your ear. So that would be the next step in that one. Yeah. Yes. So it's a typical case of, you know, manufacturers getting smart and thinking, well, what do people already have? They have hats on their head. And maybe that's a good place, you know, most of the heat escapes in the head. So, or earphones and so on. Yeah, yeah it's a good idea. Maybe temperature works as well. And um, going forward along those lines, so this beacon and most of the ones that you can buy, um, they do send out these pulses, like I mentioned. But in interestingly enough, and I don't know why, but uh, they, they can send their battery level, which is kind of expected. You, know, you can read uh, the battery level from a distance. But it has an accelerometer as well. I don't know why. I mean, usually they're on table or something. What, a table is going to fly through your room? or I, I don't know. Anyway, so it has an um, accelerometer and a thermometer inside. So you could, for example, a lot of people think of things like attaching this to um, the spokes of a bicycle. And then they know how far they've traveled. <laughs> like with a beacon. So they're using the re, uh, refunctioning beacons to do other things. Or alarm system, you know, uh, when the bicycle moves too much, uh, then you get a signal for that. Thermometer, I don't know what you would use with the beacon, but <coughs> anyway, that's a, yeah, a lot of different feet functions in one place. And um, so anyways, this thing, I forgot to talk to tell what it was. I guess the SCIO is scientific something or other. And um, this is a molecular sensor that works over Bluetooth. And so it's measuring your food and the calories inside and the kind of things that are in your food, but it's measuring your blood as well. You can put it on your finger and then uh, without cutting it open or anything like that, it just tells you, oh, you have a lot of uh, cholesterol or is there a lot of sugar in your, in your blood? Um, yeah, so, and I'm not sure if they have some kind of portal where you have to sign up first or an account where they store your data. It's kind of creepy. So I don't know if that belongs in our free software um, situation. That's why we don't have any to do this. But um, 
So we were speaking of, of wearables, right? And this is a pop quiz now, kind of keep things interesting. Does anybody know what a B-A-N is, what a ban is? Can you imagine? Do you think it's maybe the same thing as, well, okay, I'll just say it. It's a body area network. And this is not just some journalist that came up or a word that was invented. This came, went through this typical standardization process, the same one that IEEE uses for LAN and so on, and the FCC and the uh, EC uh, telecommunications offices have all, have all really uh, talked about which frequencies are available for bands. <laughs> so, you know, these are, this is a network that's, that keeps on your body, so it's connecting this to your phone and so on, your belt buckle to your hat or whatever. So that's quite bizarre. And this is not a sensory platform, actually. That's just a rubber duck. <laughs> 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 yeah. So <laughs> what is this critical infrastructure? So we're going to have to go a little faster, I think, because I don't know how many. Uh, let's see, ethics on legality. That might be interesting. These are some sensors that we can buy today and use in a consumer, um, uh, in a normal consumer environment, like at, ho at, at home or whatever. Um, what are they actually? Electro pill doses, so that might be useful for senior citizens or people who can't see very well. You know, audio signal when you open the the, the pill um, uh, case or something. Oh, okay. Anyway, and um, yeah, I think we got kind of got into this. Um, the difference between devices that um, that that send data and receive data or are sensing their environment or acting on it, like LEDs or lasers or things that blow air, like motors with propellers, those are all actuators because they are acting on their environment. They're actually not sensing anything. And uh, sensors are just the opposite. They're not having any effect on their environment. They're just sensing from it. So it's kind of a um, uh, principle that's, that's important to understand when you're building IoT empires like we'll do in the evening. Um, here's an example, for example, of an actuator. Uh, in fact, but I, I can't remember what it can do. I haven't really worked with it too much. This is a, a smart um, lamp, and um, it has a Zigbee transmitter uh, inside, so this is sending data and, um, or, or exchanging data and receiving telecommands, right? So some computer somewhere is saying turn on, turn off, and change the color. Right? And that would mean that this is an actuator. Um, and then a lot of other things like the beacons are uh, sensors. But, uh, well, it's kind of, a beacon is a kind of both in some ways because it's sensing temperature and so on. But it's, it's really sensing proximity. It's kind of a complicated explanation. Um, right, and then we saw the, um, we, were, we saw this, uh, this sensory routing um, model, which was kind of explaining this concept of uh, the computer nodes that sit in the middle between the sensors and then receive data and store and forward it, right? So let's see if, uh, so this is the actual <laughs> definition which uh, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different versions of it, there's Wikipedia and so on, I like this one from NASA. Um, telemetry is the highly automated communications process by which measurements are made and other data collected at remote or inaccessible points of transmitting it to receiving or from monitoring. So that's that. And uh, telecommand is the one where you're sending commands to an actuator which turns something on, heats the air or something. Telecommand is a command sent to control a remote system or systems not directly connected to the place from which a telecommand is sent. Right. And um, so the question that follows is that when things are sending data or receiving data, then what is the, the, the messaging protocol? Uh, what are the are there handshakes or what is uh, relevant and, and good for serial communications? Do we need error corrections and these kind of things? And there are quite a lot of interesting solutions to this. A lot of people have tried to solve this in different ways. And these are just some of the examples. Um, the one we'll use the most, and we've already seen with, the, with Mr. Cat5, um, was MQTT, the message queue telemetry transport. And it's pretty well represented in all of the free software places. Uh, like, um, there's just all kinds of libraries in GitHub, and Node.js has libraries as well. Eclipse Foundation has a library. So you can choose your language, C or Java or whatever, and you have a library that speaks MQTT. 
And uh, that's basically, yeah, well, it's a messaging protocol. Um, CoAP is another one, which is uh, very similar to HTTP. A lot of people want to use X, uh, something like HTTP uh, for communicating between nodes, but it's a very heavy protocol. You have a uh, really big, um, header, um, really big, um, uh, well, the, the portion of the data is small in comparison to all of the, the, the packet that you have to send, so it's not very practical for low power devices. You really run out of battery soon. And folks thought about, well, how can we change that and improve that, optimize it for the IoT? And they came up with a constrained uh, application protocol, which is very similar to HTTP. So people comfortable with web interfaces are, um, are very uh, attracted to this one here because they're not relearning things as much. AMQP is a very popular one as well for uh, kind of historical purposes. It started on uh, quite early. This is one that RabbitMQ um, is um, natively speaking. It's uh, RabbitMQ, I think is a Python or Ruby, uh, I don't remember it. It's a, it's a server which is available in Debian and a lot of different operations and they just install it very easily. Um, that's MQP, AMQP. And then there's some others which you don't find as much, which do very well with, um, with, uh, with IPv6, for example, uh, zero and Q. I like it quite a lot, but I haven't seen it too much. It just likes our RFC goes zero and Q, of course. Yeah, well, it's saying no sector, but they have specifications for it. Oh, okay, yeah, it's, I think I've used this as a placeholder. And another question about this, maybe you know, um, because all of the others have, uh, W3C or IEEE or RFCs from some standards body. Do you know if they, as far as I know, it's kind of a self enclosed uh, organization, yeah? Yeah. So who knows, maybe they'll standardize along with the, the typical people, IEC and, and so they on. They publish numbers, so it's not like, they have product their specification, so it's not like you have to like look at the code. The protocols are all over. Yeah. And that's the most imp important part, isn't it? That the documentation is there someplace and it and it's, it stays stable. It's very lightweight, so it's it's stable. Yeah. Why is it that there's no gap on the blue Well, SNMP, HTTP, XMPP, these are all useful protocols, but they're all very heavy as well. And um, it depends on, well, like you said, the uh, use case. If you have things connected to electrical to 220, for example, the, it does come into question that uh, you can leverage, uh, you know, legacy uh, systems very easily when you don't have to uh, remake the system using new protocols. But the reason it's not there is because we're focusing on low power uh, devices, which work much better with very lightweight protocols. How do you call SMMP heavyweight? It's the most lightweight thing in the world. This ID, this is data. No more, no, nothing. Yeah, there are some telecommands that you need uh, one byte. And then the headers for SNMP uh, um, exchange, which, uh, yeah, it's maybe not so much for SNMP, for SNMP but for HTTP, it is the case. And there's, a, there's SIP, for example, as well. So I, can't, I, can't, I don't know if I can think of a very good reason to not use SMMP right now. It was made for this. For messaging, it was, yeah. Uh, okay. uh, I worked in embedded systems in the end of the 90s and we used, to, we used a bus system called uh, CAN buses in both in machine and in cars. And packet sizes were usually like eight bytes. Right. So you wanted to get send one packet and so you had eight uh, bytes. I think I, I don't remember, but it was something like eight bytes. That you want, 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 uh, want to put everything in eight bytes and be done with it in one packet, right. and that's quicker, easier, and it's usually easier to cope with because in C code you don't have eight bytes to analyze. It becomes Do these very. Uh, uh, fit in eight bytes? I don't know. He knows better because I haven't been doing the application in years. But that's the kind of packet sizes we work with. Yeah. yeah. So. It, it is a size factor sometimes, quite often, but there are some other reasons as well. So I'll just give you one example here. With MQTT, you have things like, uh, um, you have the last will, which basically means when your drone is firing MQTT messages to your router, your sensory router, and it goes out of range, 
then the router knows it's dead. And the last will is the is the um, concept that if so, the drone before it goes out of range, it says, "I have a last will." If I go out of range, then you should do this. Then it sends a, a command before it's dead. And after it goes out of range, then the sensory uh, uh, computer uh, carries out this command. It disconnects it, maybe it does some change in a database or something. So it has special features. It has um, a quality of service as well. So you can say something like, the NPGT has four, four levels of quality of service. And the typical one is, is just one. It says, uh, send a message and don't expect it to arrive. Probably it arrives, but it's not important. And then number four is the most important. It's, it's not only guaranteeing that it arrives, but it's guaranteeing that it doesn't arrive more than once. And so you have these kind of special features. Um, but I don't know if that, you know, you can use SNMP. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. So, and these are some transports. Those were protocols, typical protocols that are usually in use for IoT systems. And these are the kind of things that they are used. Um, oh. Yeah. So once again, things like low energy or Bluetooth smart is one of the reasons that so that we can use batteries like this thing. You know, on IP, TCP IP probably would last four weeks or maybe one week. And uh, but they use uh, Bluetooth smart and can last for three years on a simple coin cell battery. Um, and then Zigbee is another pro um, transport which is interesting. Both of these actually can uh, <laughs> automatically mesh together. So you don't have to worry about um, the type of topography. We'll look at some topographies later, but you put these different lamps. This is a Zigbee lamp, and you put another one next to it. And as long as this one, as long as at least one of them was connected to the controller, which is speaking Zigbee with, the, with each other, then the controller knows what to do when another lamp is connected farther down the, the hallway and maybe out of range. It can't speak directly to the controller, but it can't speak to this one. And so you have these uh, strange topologies, network topologies, which are quite useful for the Internet of Things. Um, these, are, these are kind of new features that you don't have in old uh, or legacy transports like IPv4, IPv6, and so on. Um, it's all very interesting. The trouble is, of course, when you have all of these transports and you're trying to uh, manipulate a, a light bulb after the, the controller goes uh, offline, well, you have to speak Zigbee, you know, with some other uh, tra transmitter. And so that gets quite difficult. And we have some devices, some gateways and, and so on, which can bridge technologies. But it's... Um, it's still quite new, it's early on, it's cutting edge. So a lot of things don't work very well. Um, we were talking about MQTT when we did, um, uh, when we saw the, uh, the, the Cat5 in the beginning. Does anybody know what, uh, what very well-known um, software uses MQTT for its messaging between nodes? Well, it's the Facebook Messenger. And which are the nodes, which are the products? These are the humans, of course, right? So we're uh, communicating with each other using MQTT every day if you're using Facebook. Does anybody know what Facebook is? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. Not in this place. It's free software. So, um, yeah, typically, that's time we had yeah, yeah. So typically we start, uh, okay, so this is kind of the code. This is what, I'm just going to go really fast because we don't have time. But um, it's, it's really nice to watch this work. And this is a hello world where you have two different computing nodes. And then you send, uh, you subscribe on one, and you publish with the other. Oops. And you let's go to the next one. And you publish with the other. So um, this is a, it, it, MQTT is a broker, brokering system. So you have um, a channel. It's, uh, for example, uh, uh, it's like a channel sensor. Another channel is actuated. And then you have sub channels. So you have sensor, temperature, Hallway, so you can have uh, uh, nested channels. And this is kind of built into the protocol. So it's another reason that sometimes you don't want to use XMPP or, or SNMP or something else. That was MQTT, and this is going back to the, the diagram we had before, which, um, uh, yeah. I mean, we, we just to kind of recap, those are the smart um, street lamps there, and this makes more sense when we have live demonstrations. 
and I think we'll just fire through this. These are the typical topographies which we find, and the mesh is somewhere along here. This is the one that Zigbee and, um, and Z-Wave are using. Either this, uh, sometimes it's partial mesh, usually full mesh. Here's a star topology, which is the typical web server or uh, mail server or um, anything. Most things TCP IP related use star topology. Bluetooth is a little different, different because um, they call it PicoNets, and you can bridge masters, but you typically, so they use different uh, terminology. They have masters and slaves, and well, that's the way a, a Bluetooth PicoNet looks like. And this is the way a, a Bluetooth packet looks. It has kind of like a MAC address, and that's how the way it looks at least. Um, but it's a, called a, what is it called? A device, device address, I think. Bluetooth device address. Um, We'll go past that to different layers. These are the typical devices that you can buy or applications useful with Bluetooth and Bluetooth Low Energy. So medical, geography, um, so proximity, and so on, industrial monitoring, gas monitoring. And we don't have demonstrations, but I wanted to show that if you have an Android <coughs> phone, this is very easy to capture Bluetooth packets. But any, actually, anything 2.4 gigahertz, I think. Um, no, it's maybe just Bluetooth packets. Yeah, so this is what most people don't know, that in the developer options, you can uh, select the Enable Bluetooth HCI, HCI SNU. It's kind of like the promiscuous mode for um, TCP IP. And then once you do that, you get a LARC file. I can't remember what it is. Oh, the LARC file is here. I probably can't even see that. Oh, the horrible file name for LARC file. Well, we have a Android. And, uh, and it's quite, quite informative, and uh, it's good for learning Bluetooth. Um, so a few resources to end off. Here's a nice telemetry book that you can download for free and uh, learn a little bit about MQTT. It's in the Red Book series. Uh, this, uh, this slide deck is online, so uh, I'll, I'll show you the URL later. Rethinking the IoT is kind of um, explaining new uh, models for uh, connecting in our, in our legacy worlds. Um, yeah, and then we can see an example of what we don't want to happen in the Internet of Things. This certainly would be the horror scenario. Next, you can imagine the next part. You can imagine what happens when all the devices in the world group together and start to fight against the humans. Right? Yeah. Probably <laughs> still <laughs> film as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So I would welcome folks to come on up. You can ask questions at the same time. Feel free. Um, but I think that's all we have time for. Here and ask a question.
questions, that's of course fine. Uh, in that case, let me just tell you that uh, the next session in this room will be. Um, let me see. You can probably customize check yourself your if you want. Uh, <laughs> customize your Ubuntu workshop uh, desktop. Uh, in uh, Lila Hersal, and you will have a talk on uh, the Who Controls History. It's about uh, open access to archival data and stuff like that. And upstairs, we will have uh, a session. Uh, about public access to information. So, uh, 